the big number 5 tornado that destroyed a third of the city of Joplin in Montana in May of 2011 is a part of the on-the-ground outcome of what the Ulysses Space Probe Team had observed in 2008 in the form of the 30% reduction in solar wind pressure that resulted in the 20% increase in the number of high-energy cosmic rays. NASA stated on the closing Ulysses report that those were the highest cosmic ray numbers in the 50 years when measurements were recorded. Considering that the AP Magnetic Field Strength Index recorded on Earth, that correlates closely with what Ulysses saw, today's cosmic ray flux density should be still higher. This increase may be responsible for the large increase in tornadoes in the south-slash-central U.S., where in a single three-day period from April 26 to 28 the whopping 312 tornadoes happened. The 30% reduction of the solar wind pressure that Ulysses saw, which reflects the weaker sun, has its effect delayed by a few years according to the time it takes for the weaker winds to reach the edge of the heliosphere, where the effect becomes manifested. We are now seeing those effects unfolding as consequences of what Ulysses saw the cause of. When the Ulysses probe was on its third polar orbit around the Sun, it measured a 30% reduction of the underlying solar magnetic field. A corresponding reduction has also been measured on Earth, in the intensity of the Earth's magnetic field published, as the AP index. No mechanistic cause exists that can affect the magnetic field strength of both the Sun and the Earth simultaneously. However, a change in the effective electric density surrounding the solar system as a whole can weaken both the Earth and the Sun together. The Sun is not its own master. It is merely an electric energy converter. When the electric energy input weakens, the solar activity and everything that is associated with it correspondingly weakens, including the solar wind pressure and the magnetic field strength, which is electrically powered. The Earth's magnetic field is affected in the same manner as it is a part of the solar system. The electric density that affects the Sun affects the Earth likewise, including its magnetic field. All magnetic fields are the direct effects of flowing electric currents. Their strength reflects the density of the flowing electric current. Since the electric density that surrounds the solar system is not visible or measurable, we can nevertheless measure its effect. We can measure the solar system's effective electric density by measuring its effect on Earth that is expressed in the Earth's magnetic field. Ulysses has shown us that what causes changes in the magnetic field on Earth also causes corresponding changes in the solar wind density and in the sun's own underlying magnetic field which in time become reflected in the intensity of the 11-year solar activity cycles measures as sunspot cycles which are often incorrectly predicted for this reason the differences that we see in the Ulysses radiograph between the start and end of the first orbit for example are reflected right here on earth in the measurements for the AP index what Ulysses saw was an electric effect that is not affected by the 11-year solar cycles. Ulysses should have seen the upswing in solar activity from 1997 on, but it didn't. It saw the downswing of the AP index instead. This disproves that the electric conditions on Earth are the direct result of solar activity, as is widely believed, but are instead the result of an electric weather pattern that affects the entire solar system together. The solar activity cycle, expressed in sunspot numbers, shown here in brown, follow the general trend of the AP index, but with its own dynamics. The primary factor for our climate, though, is the underlying electric climate that affects the solar system as a whole, which the AP index represents. In December 2009 the index dropped to its lowest point, down to 2, which coincides with the unusually massive snowfall that winter that caused havoc throughout the northern cities. The reduced solar wind pressure that Ulysses saw, which is reflected in the AP index, is also directly reflected in colder climates on Earth as recorded in measurements taken on the ground at the Solar Terrestrial Institute in Irkutsk, in the isolated mountains north of Mongolia. All this means that the magnetic measurements taken around the Earth, which becomes combined into the AP index, give us a near-perfect way to indirectly measure the electric density around the solar system and its effect on our climate. The cooling in the 1970s, 
for example, is clearly visible, that caused the scientists around the world to become concerned about the next Ice Age glaciation cycle, which became hijacked in 1974 and turned into the global warming scare. We are presently at a much colder stage than in the 1970s period. Our climate is presently the coldest in 75 years. But can we make predictions based on that? No, we can't. Nevertheless we can take note that the energy in the solar system has become increasingly unstable. As one scientist on the WhatsApp with that website has stated that the solar system is, as he put it, is in a full-blown funk, and your guess is as good as mine as to when it might pull out of it. He adds that so far, predictions by NOAA and NASA as Hathaway have not been near the reality that is being measured. In other words, the solar system has entered a zone of unprecedented instability that leaves many people baffled ever since its power level dropped to a lower plateau of intensity in 2005 period and this drop was dramatic. It actually started with a sharp measured increase in the AP index from August to September in 2005, going from 14 to 20, followed by a drop to 8. The huge Hurricane Katrina at the end of August 2005, which devastated New Orleans, occurred in this time frame. It may have been caused by a combined shock effect in the electric density on Earth and in cloud formation. Instabilities are normal in electronic systems at the transition front when sharp changes occur. We see the equivalent of this now on the larger scale that affects the entire solar system at once. An example is the rare superstorm that started on Saturn in December of 2010. It appeared to correspond with the greater cosmic ray density that affects the entire solar system, which reflects the extremely low power level indicated at the time by the low AP index. On Earth, the same effect has caused a massive increase in snowfall that resulted into flooding. Drought conditions, wildfires, tornadoes, and so on, with enormous social consequences worldwide, since the frequent rapid changes in of the overall electric density in the solar system, and especially the recent sharp downturn, evidently does not have a local mechanistic cause that anyone can mathematically predict, but is instead rooted in far distant cosmic dynamics, so that nobody can reasonably assume to know whether or not the now ongoing trends, including the cooling trends, will reverse, and if so, whether it will be in 10 or in 20, or in 30 years, or in a hundred years. Or whether they will accelerate and stage the Ice Age transition to the next 90,000-year glaciation cycle. And so, in looking forward, we need to look at what is vital to our existence that we need to protect on Earth in order to survive under the worst possible conditions that the ever-changing electric power streams can present to us in the transition from interglacial to glacial climates on Earth. The numerous predictions that one hears for a reversal of the ongoing trend in a few decades or a century appear to be all based on historic long and short term variations that have occurred throughout the interglacial period, such as the Little Ice Age. But can we gamble on the assumption that the current trends, which, as has been noted, have become funky in the extreme, will reverse? The global agriculture is presently deeply affected by the increasing cooling trend, even while the underlying cosmic ray flux has increased barely 20%. For half a decade the moderating greenhouse effect has become noticeably reduced. Cloudiness has become noticeably increased. We see the social consequences with great pain as floods disable farmlands, droughts destroy crops. Tornadoes kill people, hurricanes devastate entire regions, and climate variations prevent the timely planting and harvesting. Enormous loss have already occurred. Can we gamble that what we have seen unfolding since 2005 might not be the beginning of a long progression towards ever more of the same with no reversal as the interglacial period ends, as it always has? Obviously we cannot risk this gamble. The large-scale infrastructures, such as water diversion infrastructures, for greening the deserts, which we will need anyway to survive the coming Ice Age glaciation cycle had we started to build them in the 1970s when the science community became concerned, would have prevented a lot of today's problems that now affect the global food supply. We would have new cities springing up rapidly in the newly developed areas with free universal housing 
we might even have floating agriculture operating already in the tropical oceans, which we will likewise need at whatever time the glaciation cycle begins. The startup of the floating agriculture system would have prevented the trend towards today's hungry world. The current global food supply on the traditional production platform falls far short of what is needed, nor would the cancellation of the burning of food as biofuels make up for the shortfall, though it would go a long way in that direction. This means the kinds of infrastructures are already needed today, that we need for surviving the coming Ice Age glaciation. The Ice Age imperative should be the global imperative right now, in a big way, and should have been that for the last 35 years already that have become years that were wasted, our existence hangs already in the balance. Nothing justifies any further risk-taking by not acting on the basis of the Ice Age precursors that we see more and more of. The big factor that blocks our acting on this vital front is the chokehold put on science that allows only mechanistic perceptions and blocks the evident reality of electrodynamics. Cosmic electrodynamics is a forbidden subject under the Wellesian and Fabian doctrine that still governs science and so is anything that challenges the global warming dogma. Much will be decided by on which side of the scale we will place our life and how just we are thereby with ourselves, we live already in the kind of world where the question of the Ice Age is ultimately immaterial, because the trend towards it may be already in progress, as many indicators suggest. If we consider our critical human needs and the consequences of a potential long-term cooling trend that puts us in danger, whether this trend gets interrupted or not, we cannot afford the gamble that the Earth's climate trends will graciously snap back to normal and spare us a crisis that we have the power to avoid if we care to do so instead of gambling with our fate. We should act on the assumption that the transition to the next glaciation cycle has started and cannot be stopped because this potential does exist. For this reason the worst potential possibility must be our guide, because it amounts to suicide or genocide to take the chance that the interglacial warm period might last a little longer so that we won't need to act when the opposite might happen. But who will act? Who is willing to join hands across the table for an Ice Age renaissance socially, economically, politically, and internationally, in order to assure that the show gets off the ground, and the needed Ice Age renaissance happens? Indeed, who will act? There is no commitment towards decisive actions apparent across the entire field of humanity. Nothing is being done to end hunger in the world. To the contrary, we burn more and more food. In order to meet the empire's biofuel production quota, the European Union has recently begun leasing agriculture lands in the poor countries on which to grow feedstocks for biofuels, thereby increasing the world hunger still further. Where are the leaders who champion humanity? Do you see anyone standing in the hustings fighting for a reversal of the ongoing trend towards ever greater inhumanities? There is no one standing dramatically on the side of humanity and its general welfare. The point is that considering the near-universal lack of commitment to solve today's little problems by which 15% of all humanity already lives in chronic starvation, while the whole of humanity shrugs its shoulders and keeps on burning ever more food, what a chance do we give ourselves with this mentality to meet the huge challenges that come with the near transition to the deep ice age glaciation, which is after all the normal state of our planet in the present epoch? and will remain that for several million more years. We are mentally, socially, and politically unqualified for the long-term normal world that looms before us. We live in a classical tragedy today, where the whole of humanity has become so isolated from one another and from its future that it has become impotent to just playing their part as spectators in the game of empire that by its openly stated intention, aims to keep humanity tied down scientifically and to eradicate four-fifth of it within a few decades. And we do place our life into this court. We are all stuck in this trap. But why? Don't we, as human beings, have the power to stand dwell as masters over the imperial landscape of madness, just as we have the power to master the physical effects that the Earth's normal climate has in store for us? While the physical aspects of the Ice Age challenge are actually quite easy to meet, 
Though it may take a century to fully implement the needed infrastructures, the aspects of our enslavement to self-genocide that prevents us from building what needs to be built are much more difficult to deal with. They are the real clincher 